Welcome to Simplify. I'm Ben Schumann Solar. And I'm Caitlin Schiller. Simplify is for anybody who's taken a close look at their habits, their happiness, their relationships, or their health and thought, there's got to be a better way to do this. This week's episode, oh man, you talked with a neuroscientist. You love neuroscientists. I did. Neuroscientist and musician, Daniel Levitin. Yeah, Daniel Levitin, he's the author of The Organized Mind, which is about how our brains, quote unquote, organize the world into meaningful pieces. He also wrote This Is Your Brain on Music. He's got a new book out. It's called Weaponized Lies, which is about critical thinking in the information age. Yeah, we're super excited to, to have him. And that book is amazing. It's, it basically is a handbook on how to read the news and not get taken. Yeah. These days, Levitin braids together his interest in the mind and how we make meaning and tell truth and the neuroscience of music into these incredibly intelligent science books that it read like, well, they kind of read like music. I've never so deeply enjoyed reading a book about science. And I like science. Yeah, you're, I had your copy of The Organized Mind this week to prepare for this. It has like a thousand blue post-it notes in it. My favorite ones um, just have giant arrows and the word this. <laughs> I've never felt more millennial in my entire life. <laughs> I think you used every, every post-it that we have in the office. I think that might be true. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy reading all of our guests' books, but I actually wanted to read this book from cover to cover and really take my time with it. I feel like now and after this conversation, I have a much more intimate understanding of why our brains do what they do and how to keep my brain sharp. Yeah. And apropos brain sharp, we will... Talk about more stuff people can read after the interview when they want to. Yep. Um, but let's get into the talk with uh, Daniel Levitin and Caitlin Schiller and see you guys in the bookend. Could you please start out by introducing yourself? Hi, Caitlin. I'm Daniel Levitin. I'm a neuroscientist and an author and uh, also a musician and record producer. I wish that we could cover everything because you have such a, a breadth of expertise, but I wanted to talk to you today about the organized mind and I guess more of your, your work in neuroscience. You start out, I think it might even be in the introduction, you contend that our brains are wired to to want to organize things, which seems kind of counterintuitive given the disarray into which many of us slip if we're left to our own devices. Could you talk a little bit about how our brains are wired to want to organize things? I think we humans and many other species do have an urge to organize. Now, it may not seem that way when you walk into a messy kitchen or a messy apartment with clothes strewn around, but in a, a more macro way, um, we are organizing the world around us. I mean, we can have messy apartments and kitchens and such, but we still manage to, most of us, most of the time, show up at work at least sufficiently often to get paid. And so we've organized our time. And, you know, we, we tend not to leave the house in our pajamas. So we've organized our getting dressed in the morning and things like that. The biological imperative is to have the kind of order in your life that will facilitate your goals. Now, that might be more apparent, say, in the bower bird, a species hmm. of bird that arranges rocks and pebbles and twigs and decorative items around its habitat uh, in a symmetrical way uh, so that if an intruder comes by while the bowerbird was out, the bowerbird will know that something has breached the defensive perimeter. Mm -hmm. And so that's a way that even a bird organizes its environment to help it to know what's going on in the world. The way that you talk about organization is a way that I think a lot of us don't think about organization. When I hear the word organization, I think about having a tidy desk or having a limited amount of stuff in your in your junk drawer. But organization is really just the way that we think about things. Yeah, I, I agree with that conceptualization. And it's interesting because I had two professors when I was a student who I, I think were equally brilliant, um, far smarter than I'll ever be. And <laughs> Uh, they had very different organizational styles. Um, one of them had piles and piles on his desk. And on the floor, uh, you'd walk into his office and you'd have to, you know, step carefully, th uh, you know, across the pile. Some of the piles were waist high. Um, but I remember walking into his office and I said one day, say, you know, I, I never got back that paper that I wrote for you 10 years ago. 
He says, oh, yeah, yeah. She said, I'm sorry, I know right where that is. <laughs> he goes to <laughs> one of the piles, and he goes you know, down about a fifth of the way, and, and he finds it within 30 seconds. <laughs> and then I had this other professor whose desk was spotless, and his office was spotless. Except, you know, there'd be one folder on his desk at a time, and that's what he'd be working on. Uh-huh. And, you know, one of them had the organized system in his filing cabinets. The other had it in his head. That's the only difference. Well, I think our mutual friend David Allen would, would really dislike that first method. David um, inspired me greatly to write The Organized Mind. Uh, I wanted to uncover and share the neuroscientific basis for so much of what he recommends and prescribes uh, in his Getting Things Done book and, and his series of books, in fact. And, and I also wanted to explore some topics that he doesn't get to, like this broader conception of what it means to be an organized species or what it means to us as individuals. But I do practice the David Allen method. I, I'm making lists and I'm prioritizing them and I'm doing the different um, levels of analysis of what I need to get done. You know, the 30,000 foot view versus the one inch from the topic view. Yeah, absolutely. He just really has it figured out. He's the, one of the most relaxed people I've ever met. Well, that's the thing, right? We, you started out using a phrase, something like, what most people think of when they think of as organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think most people think that being organized requires what we used to call a type A personality, a really nervous sort uh, who is constantly vigilant and looking around for a piece of paper on the table that's two degrees askew, a kind of compulsive sort, an OCD kind of sort. And I suppose that that can be some organized people. But what I've found is that organizing my life, my world, my social world, my time, and organizing things in my head actually has calmed me down a great bit because my brain isn't constantly reminding me of things it's afraid I'll forget. I now have a system that prevents me from forgetting things or from doing things in the right order. Uh, and that's that was a lot of what I wanted to share with the organized mind. Yeah, what I loved about it was that it also feels practical. It's written in a super approachable way, and I, I felt like I took things away from it that I can use in my life. I've been talking about the sleep section to anybody who will listen to me for the past week or so. I I was shocked reading that you rebound sleep is not a thing you can get, um, that we can't borrow sleep time. What is something that you wish people better understood about sleep? Well, a lot of the things that we heard growing up uh, what you might just call uh, folklore about sleep, just isn't true. Uh, there's There's been a great uncovering of information within the science of sleep in, in the last 10 years or so. Most of that information hasn't trickled down to the public, which I think is a shame. In fact, I'd say a lot of what neuroscientists, neurobiologists have found in the last 10 or 20 years hasn't reached the public, and I tried to pack as much of that as I could into the organized mind, not just about sleep, but about how memory works and how attention works and strategies for being productive and strategies for avoiding procrastination and that kind of stuff. On the sleep side of things, good sleep hygiene is really important. Your body responds best if you can figure out a way to go to sleep at the same time every night and get up at the same time every morning. Uh, and of course that's not possible every single day, but it's important to understand that for 99% of the population, if you deviate from that, you're going to effectively lose IQ points. You're going to lose your ability to be your best self very quickly. Yeah, that was a total shock to me. And the other thing that I thought was interesting was, um, that your brain can, parts of your brain can take little naps. How is that possible? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so we, we tend to think of consciousness as an all-or-nothing state. I'm either conscious or I'm unconscious. I'm awake or I'm asleep. And in fact, it's better to think of these things as falling along a continuum. Your various degrees of alert, your various degrees of conscious. And there's quite a lot of experimental research now that shows this to be true. 
And so, yeah, a, p- a part of your brain can fall asleep. Uh, this is what often what happens when you've forgotten a word or a name, or if you're driving on the freeway, uh, where you are, the Autobahn, I suppose. <laughs> yes. Uh, and you suddenly realize you don't know where you are. You, 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 you're still on the road, but you think you might have missed your turnoff, but you don't remember whether you saw it or not. That part of your brain was asleep. <laughs> I find that sort of charming and sort of scary at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, usually if the part of you that's driving the car falls asleep, you feel it coming on unless <laughs> yeah. you have narcolepsy or something. The, the part that you're f- most focused on is is harder to fall asleep without you knowing it. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, thank goodness. But there are all these background, hundreds of background processes going on in your mind that uh, that fall asleep. You might for, you might skip a meal because you're so absorbed in what you're doing. Well, the part of you that keeps track of your blood sugar fell asleep. Mm. For me, the part that usually falls asleep is the part that puts the water in the coffee pot before putting it on the burner. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a whole other thing about repetitive actions or things that we've done many, many times. What do you mean? Well, I don't know how old you are, but you're probably over 18. Oh, yes. You've you've probably walked up and down stairs many, many times. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were three years old... You hadn't walked up that many stairs, and you paid very close attention to where you put your feet and maybe your hands, if you were hand and footing it. <laughs> uh, and, and it was kind of an event to be on stairs for, for most kids of that age. And as you get older, you've climbed so many stairs that it's become routine. It's beca- you become complacent about it. You don't pay close attention. And next thing you know, you've fallen. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you've allowed it to recede into the background. Taking pills in the morning for a kid, unless the kid is really sick. You know, a, a kid having to take a pill is an unusual event. Kid's not going to forget that they took a pill this morning. Mm-hmm. Somebody who's 70 is. They've taken so many pills in their life, there's nothing unique about the event. That's why they've got these little pill reminders. It, it's not because they're going to forget to take the pill. It's that they might forget that they already took it. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Right. Actually, this this reminds me of the section on on memory. I think it's the section on memory in your book when you talk about how, or it was the organization of time, I think, how time seems to go so much more slowly when you're young than when you're old because memories are more novel. Could you talk a little bit about that, actually? Because I think that's something that people think about a lot is, is why it feels like time goes so much faster as we age. Well, it's, it's two reasons. Um, the idea is that your conception of time is nonlinear. And for the non-mathematical among our friends and listeners, what I mean by that is that the same minute doesn't feel the same at the different phases of your life. And by analogy, think about wealth. If you are indigent, a homeless person, if, if you have no money, $5 means a whole lot to you because it, it, it's an enormous proportion of your wealth. Uh, if you have only $5 to your name, another $5 is a big deal. If you only have $100 to your name, another $5 is still a big deal, but not quite as big a deal. If you're a millionaire, you know, walking down the street, you might not bend over to pick up a $5 bill if it's in the sewer, and you're afraid your suit might get dirty. <laughs> so time kind of functions in this nonlinear uh, proportional way. When you're five years old, a day is a substantial portion of the amount of time you've been on the earth mm-hmm. compared to when you're 70. The, I mean, the days are precious as you get older because there's fewer of them, but they zip by uh, partly because they represent such a small proportion of your conscious awareness. Um, there are other factors. When we're older, we tend to take on projects that take longer to finish. When I was eight, I don't know about you, but when I was eight, I would come home I would read a couple of comic books, do some finger painting, uh, go out and play in the sand, uh, maybe watch a TV show, all before dinner time. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, you know, when I get home from work, home from school, um, by the time I start thinking about it being dinner time, the afternoon or the early evening has zipped by, and 
I can't think of the last time I actually finished a project in a day. Mm. Most of the things I work on have a very long event horizon, and I think that's true of many adults. You're working on projects that span over time, uh, and so that makes the time fly more quickly. Totally true. I never have time to finger paint before dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's too bad, isn't it? And a third factor in what makes time zip is that so much of what we do is routine. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not novel, and so it recedes into our attention. And because we're not fully present for it happening, it, it zips by. Mm. Actually, you know what? You just said being fully present, and it touched on something that I, I wanted to talk with you about earlier when, when we were talking about David Allen, um, and about being relaxed, actually. In your section about organizing work, you talk about how a thing that you found that highly successful people had in common was that they had external brains, And it allowed them to be really present. Um, What do you mean by external brains? Well, what I'm talking about is is doing things that we all do to externalize your memory. Mm. So one thing we do is rewrite ourselves notes, shopping lists, uh, to-do lists. That's externalizing your memory. It's relieving your brain of the burden of reminding you of these things. And it's a very important thing. A uh, great psychologist, B.F. Skinner from Harvard, used to say that uh, if he heard on the news uh, in the evening around dinner time that it was going to rain the next day, at that moment in the evening before, he would go take his umbrella out of the closet and hang it on the front doorknob. Mm. So now the environment is reminding him to bring the umbrella. Uh, other things, too. Uh, people lose their car keys or their house keys, whatever. People lose their keys. And the reason is that We're not really paying attention to what we do with them when we put them down. And there's so many places that we could put them down. And the solution to that is another form of externalization, which is just to designate rigidly a place in the house where you're going to put them. What matters is that you're consistent and that you don't violate it. And then they'll always be there. Mm -hmm. I think that you, somewhere in the book, you write that the kinds of things that we lose and go missing, like keys or I think shoes was an example, versus the kinds of things that don't go missing, like pants and <laughs> desktop <laughs> desktop keyboards. So, right. <laughs> so the kinds of things we lose says or say a lot about how our brains work. What do you mean by that exactly? Well, it, it, I, I, it is kind of funny, right? I mean, you, you might forget where you parked your car, but you don't forget that you have a car. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm trained as a, a neuroscientist, and so I'm delighted in the little ways that our foibles can open a window to the way our brains are organized and the way our thoughts are constructed. And um, the kinds of things we lose or lose track of really give a window into the normal functioning of the brain. The brain does well with, with, with rules, with putting things in a certain place. Hey listeners, this is Audi, audio editor on Simplify. I wanted to chime in and recommend a companion episode, I think, to this interview with Daniel Leviton. And it's an episode from Simplify Season 1 with productivity expert, author of Getting Things Done, David Allen. Here's a clip from the episode. Don't keep stuff in your head, it's in the wrong place. Your head's a crappy office. You know, it's for having ideas, not for holding them. As a matter of fact, research has shown that if you keep more than four things just in your head, you'll lose track of them. You will you will not have the appropriate relationship with them, with each other, etc. And you know, basically, you'll be driven by latest and loudest. So, just trying to convince people that you need to build the external brain to be able to manage the complexity and the sophistication and subtlety of our life and our commitments these days is just, I don't know how long I'll be preaching this, but folks just don't seem to be doing it. It's a big habit to change. That was David Allen from an episode from Simplify Season 1, and it's really worth checking out the whole episode uh, if you're anything like me and you need some kind of system to organize your life and your mind. Okay. Back to the interview with Caitlin Schiller and Daniel Leviton. I really wanted to ask you about the nature of memory. 
and how how actually vulnerable and iffy it is. Could you talk a little bit about that? Should we be trusting our our memories as much as we do? No. (laughs) (laughs) Emphatically not. (laughs) Um, Our memories seem to us as though they are video recordings of the world. And they're not. They are are flawed, they're fallible, uh, they're self-serving in many cases, they're self-defeating in others. The first myth to explode when we, as we explore this is that you, the degree of confidence you have in a memory, that is, the, the certainty that you have that it's accurate, in many, many cases is no judge of how accurate it's going to be. They're completely decoupled in so many, many cases. And we've seen this play out most publicly in trials where somebody will be convicted because somebody remembered seeing him there uh, at the scene of the crime or something like that. And then years later, you know, DNA evidence will not only show that somebody else did the crime, but the person who was alleged to be there was somewhere else, Mm -hmm. as he had been saying all along, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so the witnesses' memories are bad. But people misremember things about themselves and their past, You just can't trust it, and you can't trust your feeling that tells you you can trust it. What ends up getting stored in memory is often a distortion, and even if it was stored accurately, a funny thing happens in the act of remembering. When you're metaphorically pulling that memory out of your brain, at that point, any new interpretations or contexts or ideas that occur to you or that somebody mentions to you just as you've retrieved the memory can impact the way it gets restored, and so you no longer have it in its original state. It's like uh, what we saw in, in Orwell's book, 1984, which is now called Orwellian Revisionism. Hmm. The memories just get rewritten with no trace to what the previous version was. Oh, man. I, I think in the book you, you talk about how it's like every time we recall a memory, we're opening it in edit mode. That's right. And it's not like edit mode on your computer where you deliberately go in and you say, oh, well, I think I can come up with a better word for that. Or now that I think about it, it wasn't red, it was blue. It's not like, it's not just like that. It's more like you open up the computer file in edit mode and suddenly from out of nowhere, somebody spills coffee on the keyboard and a bunch of gibberish gets put in the file. Oh, no. (laughs) Or a prankster comes and changes a bunch of words in the middle of the night. And you don't know which words were changed and which weren't. It's just amazing to me that we we have put so much trust in, in our own memories and they're really this fallible. Well, this is a lot of what goes into training a judge and an attorney and a journalist, such as yourself. Uh, a, a respect for the idea that, yes, you want people to tell their story, but you need to verify it. Mm-hmm, of course. The organized mind, you said you wanted to to expose some of the the neuroscience behind the the GTD David Allen's method. But where did this book come from for you? what did what did you start? What started you along the road to writing it? Actually, I wanted to write a book about the history of filing cabinets. <laughs> okay. Uh, my editor was interested in that, and I was interested in it, and I spent some time doing research. Uh, how did filing cabinets develop? How did we end up now with the sort of standard hanging file folder on a metal rail uh, with a little tab that sticks up? And what are the principles for filing? How do, you, how do you know when to create a new folder? And what should the folder headings be? And how do you group your folders? That's really what I wanted to write about. And it turned out there wasn't much on it. There, um, I, I managed to find a patent for the guy who came up with the hanging file folder uh, idea, but I couldn't find out anything about him or his life or he's, he's dead now. It, it didn't really go anywhere. But then I started thinking that maybe my brain was trying to tell me something, that the filing cabinet thing was a metaphor for how things are organized hmm. in general. And the more I thought about what I teach as a professor to undergraduates about how the brain works, the more I realized there's a whole bunch of stuff about memory and perception, about attention, about how we form ideas, that is a standard part of my undergraduate courses that the students love, and I love teaching it. But I'd never read a book about it. 
And so I thought, well, this I want to put all of that into a book. I'm really glad you did because I'd never read a book about it, and I, I feel like I've been missing it all my life. What do you What do you wish that people understood better about their minds? Well, there are several things. One is I think that a great deal of human suffering could be alleviated if we understood that um, a lot of the ways that people behave are influenced by their upbringing, their childhood, their neurochemistry, their diet, uh, and things happening in the world outside of them, as well as things happening inside their bodies. And I say that because humanity has a history of torturing people who somehow manifest as different. Centuries, millennia of torturing and killing gay people who really don't decide to be gay. There's a complex uh, biological set of conditions. Schizophrenia was so misunderstood that, you know, in my grandparents' lifetimes, uh, people who heard voices would be considered to be inhabited by deadly spirits, and they would call an exorcist, not a doctor. We now understand there's a neurochemical basis for this, uh, and we know how to treat it, and much schizophrenia can be treated. All, um, all kinds of, as I say, all kinds of human suffering would be, I think, reduced if more people understood that there's a brain basis for behavior, mm. as opposed to some metaphysical or devilish origin. Hmm. From a neuroscientist perspective, not from your necessarily musical perspective, what's what's the biggest favor that we can do for our minds? What a great and provocative question. Uh, I think, um, well, care for them is is the, the blanket answer, and that includes things like uh, being sure that you eat a diet that's got enough protein to help your uh, neurons to function properly uh, and to do their cellular housekeeping. Um, <laughs> what a wonderful phrase. Uh, exercise, oxygenating the brain is good, mm -hmm. however you do it, as long as you don't oxygenate so much that you end up passing out and hitting your head. Uh, good sleep hygiene. And as we get older, I think the be uh, one of the things that we can do for our brain that's underappreciated is try to avoid complacency. Seek out the novel, seek out the new. That's the way to stay young. That would be a great answer to end on, but I wanted to ask you, what do you think that 20-year-old you would think of the work that you're doing today? Oh, I, I think 20-year-old me would be delighted. Yeah? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm doing all the things now that I started doing when I was 20, and so the only thing that I've given up is working on my own engine in my car. <laughs> okay. Everything else I do is pretty much the same. I play the guitar, I sing, I... Um, hang out with friends, I read, I write. It's, it's, it's the last 40 years haven't been um, that different than what I wanted to do when I was 20. That's pretty awesome. That seems like, <laughs> that seems like a win to me. The um, unanticipated part was the joy uh, in being able to talk to you and people like you to, you know, to have the opportunity to do these kinds of sharing experiences in a more public way. Yeah, it's having a good conversation is one of, I think, life's truest, deepest delights. Yeah. So what are you reading lately? Could you could you recommend any any interesting books for our listeners? This this is a podcast for for people who do love to read and love, love new ideas. Well, I, I, I read very broadly. Uh, I just finished reading Becoming Leonardo, which is mm. a fantastic book about da Vinci by Mike Lankford. I reviewed it for the Wall Street Journal, by the way, uh, and loved it. And I've been recommending that to everybody and buying copies for people. Uh, I've read everything now by Haruki Murakami. And my wife just got me for my birthday a Murakami book I didn't even know about, which I adored. It was called. It, it is called Absolutely on Music. And it's conversations between Murakami and the great conductor Seiji Ozawa. Uh, a lot of good stuff in there. And then, you know, I'm, I've got a pile of books on the floor that I need to read for my next book, for me to extract the wisdom of others and try to build on it. What's your next book about? It's called Successful Aging, Getting the Most Out of the Rest of Your Life. 
Okay, well, I will definitely be calling you back for that. Yeah, well, in 30 years when you need it. <laughs> well, I think more of the world needs it than just me. I'll call you, I'll call you in two years about All it. Right. I guess that's it. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk. It's been really such a pleasure. For me too. Thank you, Caitlin. Welcome to The Bookend, where we end with books. Man, we did it. We got Leviton on here. Super excited to have him on. And now, like, for all the people who are not as familiar with neuroscience <laughs> or as passionate about neuroscience as you are, like, let's break it down a little bit. Why did you want to have, first of all, why did you want to have Daniel Leviton on here? Okay, well, as we already know, I really like neuroscience. And if my life had not taken the course it had, I'd either want to be a perfumer or a neurolinguist, um, <laughs> which I guess is kind of like neuroscience. And on a less personal note, I think that investing in understanding how your mind works can be a really powerful way that you can help yourself get more done and relax better, have better friendships, pretty much anything else. And I figured if there were someone who could tell us about the mind in a way that felt relatable, it was this extra cool musician scientist. Yeah. And how like he sort of this is sort of the scientific basis on so much of the productivity stuff that we like the David Allen, you know, write stuff down, get it out of your brain. Your brain is a thinking tool, not a storage device, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is like the foundation for that. Yeah. Plus, like with the bonus of I studied with Daniel Kahneman's people. And yeah. And it's yeah, it's like a our like sweet spot. Yes, indeed. So um, what really stood out to you from the interview? Like, what's the one thing mm -hmm. we should remember? Well, there are a lot of things like how important sleep is and it's really, really, really important and how just fallible and crappy human memory is. But <laughs> I think that uh, that the, the thing that stood out to me the most was how important novelty is to the mind. We remember novel things better, as in our first encounters with stairs or escalators or bees as children are more memorable and surprising. And novelty helps keep our minds sharp and young when we're older, too. So seek out the new and avoid complacency, and you're already doing your mind a giant service. So yeah, we need novelty. We like it. Our brains crave it. Right. And check out this segue. I'm so ready. If you want to <laughs> do something novel, mm -hmm. like maybe read new books. Mm -hmm. So let's give them some books to read. Yeah. That was smooth, Con Ben. Conf no, <laughs> confront yourself <laughs> with new ideas. <laughs> yes what do you got all right so book number one is about sleeping it's called dreamland by david k randall and sleeping when you think about it sleeping is a pretty weird thing we basically lie unconscious for roughly a third of our lives while and the yet, brain cleans itself while the brain cleans itself it does its quote cellular housekeeping right as uh levitin says so a third of our lives we're lying there our brains are doing their cellular housekeeping we're just dead to the world and yet we and all other animals on the planet, we need sleep to survive. And Dreamland gives some scientific background on why it's so important. Um, the author is a British journalist. His name's David K. Randall. And he got interested in this topic when he injured himself by sleepwalking into a wall one night. <laughs> <laughs> and because he had a vested interest in figuring out how to sleep better, he asked experts. And he did. And there are ideas about how to do that in this book. Have you ever sleepwalked, Ben? No. No? Never in my whole life. Me either. Not that I know of. I don't think I talk in my sleep either. I'm a pretty boring sleeper. I've mumbled in my sleep. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so second book. Um, Levitin's next book is on aging and presumably focuses on the mind. So there's another book that complements it because it focuses on the lifestyle of people who live long and healthy all over the world. Isn't it like about the people who've lived over uh, 100 or something? Exactly, yeah, centenarians. So right. it's about not just old people, but really old people right. <laughs> who are like still living pretty okay lives. Mm -hmm. Apparently a lot of them are in Sardinia. But anyway, uh, it's called Blue Zones and it's written by a National Geographic fellow. It covers everything from why red wine and veganism might actually help you live longer to how putting your family first can help with that goal too. Nice. Yeah. Ben, give us one. Do you have one? Yeah, I got one. I'm pretty excited about actually. Um, in the book, in The Organized Mind, Levitin talks about the fallibility of memory, or as you would say, why memory is such bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I interviewed Daniel Schachter, who's a professor at Harvard. Right. He, wrote, he wrote a book called The Seven Sins of Memory. And we we spoke in April 2017 for the old Blinkist podcast back in the day. And so the seven sins of memory are transience, absent-mindedness, blocking, misattribution, suggestibility, bias, and persistence. Um, and like when I when I when I spoke with him, we we talked about all sorts of stuff. And there's a there's an there's an anecdote, for example, in the book about people who were asked about a video of a plane crash in Amsterdam, 
and like two thirds of the people describe the detail in detail the video, including like the angle at which the plane hit the building in Amsterdam. Um, there's no video of this plane crash at all. So it talks about like the dangers of memory. Like people are like, yeah, I remember when the video came out, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, we also talked about how to actually embed memories, and Ooh. we don't like. I don't have to replay the whole interview, but. Just one quick quote from him. He says, "The best way to remember things is to quickly embed what you want to remember in your brain by connecting it to other things. So, try to when you when you want to remember something you just learned, um, try to ask yourself questions about the information. How much do I like it? How does it relate to other things? If I say, here's a word, democracy. Remember this word, democracy. Uh, you should be like, how does this apply to me? Okay, yeah, there's an election in Germany coming up or something. Mm. And if you link it just like that, or if you say democracy, that reminds me of, I don't know." The American political system that gives me weird feelings. Okay, you've already probably encoded it enough. Yeah. And so there are ways to kind of work with this with memory and with its fallibility bullshitness. Yeah. Um, but it, it's interesting how weak it is. Yeah, and you know what I what, what I really loved about talk, what I loved about reading Danny Loveton's book and talking with him and what I like about a lot of like practical neuroscience in general is that it it doesn't deny the fact that the brain is a weird kind of beautiful but relatively rickety structure yeah. and you have to just kind of like learn how to work with it just like you know how to close your your crappy car door so it doesn't <laughs> squeak at like 2 a.m when you get back and pull into the garage yeah. you have to like learn the little tips and tricks that will help your brain do its job because it's this thing that you love and have to take care of and uh presumably want to have for a long time and work with so it's yeah it's like learning its little weirdnesses and quiddities and ins and outs and i think that's really really cool nice that's yeah. a nice note to end on yeah work with your brain it's rickety but nice it's rickety. <laughs> all right <laughs> thanks for listening to this episode of simplify it was produced by me ben schumann stoller caitlin schiller nat daroshkina and odi constantino who once helped solve a crime by opening up a colleague's macbook pro where the stolen money was found wow it was you had to be there. Wow. God, that must have been one of the days when I worked from home. Yeah. Uh, all right. So if you heard something that stuck with you in this episode because you embedded it, I hope that you will share it with someone. Um, podcasts are a great way to start a conversation. So share it with somebody you like. Yeah. And thanks, everyone, who subscribed to Simplify on Google Play, Overcast, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, wherever you listen. We really appreciate it if you also leave us a rating or give us a shout out there. It helps us spread the word and we're thankful for that. Yeah, thank you. And we are also on Twitter. I'm at Caitlin Schiller, and you can find Ben at... Bisto, B-S-T-O. Great. Okay, cool. So, last thing. Simplify is made by the same people who make Blinkist. Blinkist, if you didn't already know, is a learning app that takes insights from the world's best-selling nonfiction books and create something better than summaries. It condenses them into these focused little capsules of knowledge that you can listen to or read in just about 15 minutes. Right. And if you want to try it out, we made a voucher code so you can check it out for free. You get 14 days for free if you go to Blinkist.com slash friends and type in the voucher code Orwell, O-R-W-E-L-L, at Blinkist.com slash friends. So go check it out if you want to. Right. Ah, and okay, this is the real last thing. Thank you for sending in all of your answer to the question, what have you learned was much simpler or easier than you initially thought it was. We would like to have more of them because we love having you guys and your voices in our mid-rolls. Plus... The stories are interesting. So um, if you would like to be on a future episode of Simplify, then record a voice memo with your answer to the question, what have you learned was much easier or simpler than you thought it was, and email it to me and Ben at podcast at Blinkist.com. Yeah, we appreciate that also. Indeed. All right, well, we'll be back next week with another episode of Simplify. In the meantime, be good. This is Ben. And Caitlin checking out. Checking out. See you guys. Mm-hmm.